I'm Dr. Jessica Bush, and this is Farmer's Market Fido. Today I have a very important video for you. I've been researching this one for a really long time, so thank you for your patience in making another video, and thank you to Darwin's Natural Pet Food for sponsoring this so that I can make more videos like this because it's pretty time consuming. And also, their dedication to better nutrition for dogs is unparalleled, and I'm so grateful to be partnering with them. Today we're gonna talk about what research is out there that supports feeding raw or home-cooked diets, right? I, the first thing I wanted to answer for myself as a veterinarian when I very, very, very first embarked on this natural or species-appropriate home-cooked or raw food for dogs, a species-appropriate natural diet we would consider raw, and then also I like cooking because it meets people in the middle, right? So the first thing I did was look at the research that was available and see what was out there. And unfortunately, there really wasn't a lot. As a veterinarian, I took an oath to first do no harm. And so I didn't want to hurt my patients. And we are taught that feeding raw food has the potential to do that. And there's a lot of research out there talking about E. coli and salmonella and blah, 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 blah. And we'll talk about that in this video as well, because I want you to understand that I am being as neutral as possible, but that I base my decisions on what I feed and what I recommend for my patients on what I've seen in my own dogs and what I've seen in my patients, as well as the research, right? Because unfortunately, there's not a ton of research on fresh food for dogs, whole food for dogs, however you want to say it. So. I'm going to talk about the three studies that have been published in the last year or so that I'm really excited about and the research that we found that is supportive of home cooked or raw diet. I'm going to talk about some of the negative research. I'm going to talk about some of the research that I found that actually caused me to not want to feed a kibble diet, right? What's the alternative? What's the commercial processed food, right? what most dogs and cats eat these days. And there is a ton of research that shows why those things are actually harmful. So we're gonna talk about all of that today, but first we're gonna start with the three studies that I'm super excited about that do encourage feeding a raw or home cooked diet. There are three studies that I'm gonna highlight and there's, there are many more that you can dig into. I went through pages and pages on PubMed and Google Scholar, and I have some textbook recommendations for you if you want to read more into this yourself. But there was a study released in 2020 in Frontiers in Veterinary Science that is really, really, really cutting edge science. The, the issue with the study, there's one little small issue and is that there was only eight dogs involved in the study. Four of them were kibble fed and four of them were raw fed Staffordshire Terriers. But the coolest thing about it is that they actually did skin biopsies, which is an appropriate diagnostic technique for a dog with atopic dermatitis, which all eight of these dogs suffer from atopic dermatitis, you know, the itchy red skin. And we often associate that with food allergies or diet related issue. And they found that it indeed is a diet related issue and that feeding raw significantly improves their skin quality and the lipid ba barrier that protects the skin from outside environmental issues, but also improves their innate immunity from the inside out and reduces oxidative stress. Okay, so only four of the dogs were raw fed and we need to expand on this study, but it was a really, really fascinating study because they did DNA testing and they could actually show nutrigenomics, epigenomics, how the gene expression is different from the kibble fed dogs to the raw fed dogs. And so that is just so awesome that we're getting into science like that because we're going to be able to prove so much more. The second study is a study that was done a couple of years ago. I want to say 2016, I didn't write it down. 
in um, Scottish Terriers who have traditionally had higher rates of transitional cell carcinoma in their bladders, right? So they have bladder cancer, that's a genetic issue that they, that they have. And they found that the Scottish Terriers that were fed at least three times a week, either green, fresh green veggies, on top of a kibble diet, mind you, green veggies or orange yellow veggies had a 95% less chance of getting this bladder cancer. Now listen, it's only one breed, it's only one type of cancer, but that's actually a really good way to help control the study, right? If you try to do a study on all the breeds and all the cancers, there's gonna be way too many variables. You are not gonna be able to have a well-designed study looking at that many factors. And so I really like that they did look at just one breed and just one type of cancer. They have dramatically less cancer in the dogs that had some fresh greens. Just adding fresh greens and fresh yellow and orange veggies to the diet improved their health dramatically. I'm just like, that's so cool. And then the third one is actually, this is a new study that was released in 2020. However, oh wait, it was done in 2016, but it's, it's been on the news lately, okay? So they found that in beagle dogs, feeding them raw beef meaty bones, right? Raw beef bones does clean the teeth. This was a study that was done in Australia and published in the Australian Veterinary Journal in 2016. Now, I found this though, also in this, in this textbook here, that talks about this where, um, let's see, they did research in 1965 where if they fed dogs raw beef oxtails, the, the beagles again, because beagles are the traditional dog used for research. I guess they're pretty hardy overall and they're a really good size. And so most research dogs are beagles. So anyways, these beagles were fed in 1965, this study was done, and it proved that raw meaty bones does absolutely clean the teeth. It clears the tartar and the calculus off of the teeth. So those are three really cool studies that are out just recently that do support raw feeding, and we have more and more in the works. So next we're gonna talk about some of the studies that you'll see all in the news. It happens a lot, more often than not, you see studies that discourage raw feeding because of potential pathogenic bacteria. So I've looked at them extensively, and yes, there are some potential risks. And then there's a few other studies that we're talking about, metabolic disorders and other things, and that was because A, they either put too much thyroid gland into the food and the dogs became hyperthyroid. Well, I mean, duh. <laughs> Like you're, you're supplementing thyroid hormone and, and that's gonna happen. That was one study, that was one kennel that did that. And they found that if you feed dogs meat that is unfit for human consumption, they're gonna have more salmonella. Okay, that was another study. They found, that the recent study that I read, the headline said, feeding raw food increases the chance for humans to get E. coli infections that are dangerous. And if you actually read the study, if you actually read the study, it says all dog food samples contained pathogenic E. coli, not just raw. And that is not a dog food issue. That is a factory farming issue, in my opinion. The fact that they do feed cows antibiotics is creating more resistant bacteria. So they were concerned that the E. coli that potentially could contaminate dog foods is resistant to antibiotics. Yes. Unfortunately, that is true, and that is true of dry dog food as well. And so that study was just pointless for me to even look at that. And I hate how they skew the study. They, they just really twist the words to make a headline that will grab people's attention. So yes, can raw meat contain bacteria? Absolutely it can. But the producers of raw food these days actually have higher standards from the USDA, the FDA, on salmonella than even our own chicken in our own grocery stores have. So there are going to be times when they find that and the good news is they're looking for it, right? That's the excellent part is that they are looking for these things and that everyone is doing their due diligence and trying 
their very best to make sure that nobody encounters pathogenic bacteria that could become harmful. Another really interesting study was looking at the microbiome of dogs and found that raw-fed dogs have a different microbiome than kibble-fed dogs, and, and that seems fairly obvious. The thing that we don't know yet for sure is how much Clostridium is actually pathogenic. Some is just going to be there. Some E. coli is in every poop sample, yours, dogs, everyone, promise. E. coli is there. It's just a normal bacteria that resides in the colon and in feces, right? So, yes, there's going to be E. coli, there's going to be Clostridium, there's going to be Salmonella, and there are different techniques, and there's going to be a future video about those different techniques to help find these issues and prevent them. But I don't want you to worry too much about the headlines because unfortunately, they're clickbait. And most of the time, if you actually read into the studies and actually look at even just the materials and methods or the conclusion, just even look at the discussion of the study, you don't have to read the whole scientific paper, you will find that that one headline is just clickbait. It's, that's what it is, it's just clickbait. So to end this video discussion of the science and the research behind fresh food for dogs, let's, let's talk about some depressing things, okay? I, I'm sorry to end on a depressing note, but these are the facts and this is why you're here and this is why you're interested in fresh food for dogs and so thank you for being here and, Thank you all for over a thousand subscribers, over 1,500 now, and I'm, I'm excited to be able to share this information with you. I'm grateful that you're here improving your dog's health, learning more about canine nutrition, and now we're gonna talk about the reasons why I actually decided to stop recommending kibble diets because I don't wanna do any harm for my patients or for my own dogs. And there's a lot of research to support that these are harmful okay the first being that in kibble all kibble any kibble at all you are going to have these advanced glycation end products what this is what this is a science term for basically the burnt charred part of protein and carbohydrate okay so the mylar reaction proteins is another way to put it the, the reason that kibble is brown, it's just like if you were to grill a steak on a grill, you're gonna get those charred parts. And we now know that those things cause cancer. Now, if you grill some food on your grill once in a while, it's not gonna be a problem, but if you only used a grill to cook your food all the time and that's all you ever ate, it would be dangerous for you, it would be detrimental. And that's all most dogs and cats are actually eating these days is food containing these advanced glycation end products that are absolutely cancer causing. Unfortunately, one in three dogs and approximately one in three cats will develop cancer. And that is a depressing number that is way too many. And this is one of the reasons. The other reasons are the fact that unfortunately most kibbles will contain something, some grains or some products that have too much glyphosate. So studies have found the urine of dogs that are eating a kibble diet is very high in glyphosate. The urine of dogs fed a raw diet is actually, you find practically no glyphosate. And glyphosate is Roundup. So that is the weed herbicide, the weed killer, the herbicide that Monsanto has been made famous for, and that is sprayed heavily on most grain crops, including oats these days. Cheerios are the highest glyphosate containing cereal, and so unfortunately oats are not always safe these days either. Glyphosate is a problem, it causes cancer, it's been proven, and it's high in the urine of dogs fed kibble. Also, these advanced glycation end products are high in the urine of dogs fed kibble and in the, in the livers as well. We have also found, unfortunately, that there are chemicals that we don't always want to have in there, right? Like in 2008, when the melamine was put into the dog foods, unfortunately, we don't, even the pet food companies 
don't have perfect control of the supply chain. And that's, that's one of the issues that I have major concerns about, especially right now, because a lot of kibble, most kibble, I want to assume, because of the fact that uh, Midwestern Feeds, they did a good job, they announced it, but they found a lot of aflatoxin. They had to recall a lot of foods this last year due to high levels of aflatoxin. And unfortunately, aflatoxins, which are a toxin from a mold that grows on grains, those things are going to build up in the system. The body doesn't clear them and it's a dose dependent toxicity, meaning that because the body doesn't clear it, the dog or the cat, it's going to build and build and build. And the more that they get exposed to, the more likely it is to cause liver failure. And so it's not like, oh, they got exposed and then their body cleared it. What happens is that they got exposed and they get exposed again and again, and it builds up in there and then they end up with liver failure. And a lot of animals develop liver failure. Unfortunately, I see this in the emergency room quite often. And a lot of dogs and cats have elevated liver enzymes. And I was taught that like twice normal alkaline phosphatase is not even significant, we don't even worry about it, but the more I think about it and the more I study these things, I realize that it's probably related to the food and because so many animals are exposed to these nasty chemicals like glyphosate and advancing glycation end products and aflatoxins in their food, yeah, it's just become the norm that twice normal alkaline phosphatase in an older dog or cat, well, not so much in cats, but in older dogs is just the norm. And that's scary. I, I don't want that to be okay. I think that, unfortunately, our normals in our blood work may not actually be quite appropriate. But that's outside of the scope of this video. I hope that you watch this all the way through. I hope that you are inspired to choose better nutrition for your dogs and cats now. But I wanted to share this. This book right here is a really good book. And it has a lot of science, so if you want to dig more into studies, if you have specific questions, please feel free to put your questions in the comments here. And I will continue to make more videos and answer your questions in the comments as well as in videos. And I have a really, really, really good, good gift coming for you really soon. I've been working hard on that as well. That's why I've had a couple of months in between videos. I have a uh, surprise coming for everyone because I'm really excited about the subscribers and that people are interested in this and I get emails all the time thanking me and asking me questions, really good, really thoughtful questions. And, and so thank you guys and thank you again to Darwin's Pet Food for sponsoring this video. There will be a link below for you to try out their food. My dogs love it and are doing so well on that. So we're gonna talk more about that in the future, but right now I want you to go ahead and click the link and just try it for yourself, okay? All right, thank you, have a great day.